We're back here, Phillies number one college radio station, WHIP. Zach Gelp here with you, flying solo, taking up until noon Eastern time where Temple Sports Hour will come your way. A great segment moments ago with former Eagles legend Brian Dawkins, and now joining us on the hotline. You can hear his show each and every day from 3 to 6 p.m. on the CBS Sports Network, and he also be doing a sensational job as he does each and every year, calling the NCAA tournament and analyzing it for CBS, and that's our good friend Doug Gottlieb. Doug, it's Zach Gelp here in Philly. How you doing? I'm good, man. What's up? Doug, I'm doing great, and it was a tough loss for the Owls last night in the first round of the American Athletic Conference tournament. They dropped one to UCF in double overtime by a score of 94-90. to And Temple, they were able to score. They've been able to do it all season long, but they've really struggled on the defensive side of the ball, and last night was no different in the loss to UCF. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually a little bit more... I, I, I was actually sitting with, you know, Steve Lapis, obviously his son's on staff, and we're sitting there watching. I just I just didn't like at the end of regulation, you know, Dump has, you know, I, I, we knew where he was going with the ball, but just the idea of you, you know, give the ball to your point guard and dribbles it out for 30 seconds and then goes one-on-one, you don't really get a good look. I just, you know, you got all these plays in your back pocket, run one, you know? Uh, it's right in front of your bench. You can make adjustments on the fly. And you're calling these plays. I just, I didn't like it. I felt like that was a lost opportunity. But it wasn't like uh, Central Florida had a great plan. You know, in in overtime, and they don't really run it. They just kind of run a side ball screen and get nothing out of it. So, um, but you know, like look, 94 points. You know, giving up 90 sounds bad. But you know, when you play 50 minutes at the end of the end of a season, which is kind of a lost year, you just. It's, it's a lot like a, a meaningless bowl game. I always bet the over, you know? Yeah, and I agree with you. And this is a Temple team that they have an off year. They've been to six straight NCAA tournament appearances under Fran Dunphy. Didn't do a great job recruiting this year, uh, but the future does look bright for next year. They bring in Devin Coleman, uh, Jalen Bond. They're trying to work out Jesse Morgan's eligibility, and they bring in a top 150 recruit as well. I know you got to see Temple once live in person at the Leah Cora Center. Does it look like there's a bright future here for Temple basketball? Well, I mean, it's interesting that they've gone the way of uh, taking transfers like so many other schools have, you know, have been doing for a couple of years, for years now. Um, so I do like Jalen Bond. I think he's a, he's a, he's a tremendous talent. Um, I've seen Devin Coleman. I think he's a good player, you know, and, and one of the things is, um, you know, we, uh, oftentimes inside basketball, we talk about levels of basketball, you know, and that there's just, there's different levels and, People have a tough time really adjusting to that idea um, that that there's a difference between, for example, the A10 and the Big East. Actually, there's different levels within the, within the old Big East, or even now the Big East and the ACC. Like, uh, or you look at Butler, and I don't think Butler has good enough talent to compete in the Big East. Um, but you know, you take away their top, their best player, and suddenly they're you know they're the worst team in the Big East. So. Uh, I think the big challenge is going to be for the guys that sit out, for Dylan, who came from a, a very high level at, at Texas, from Devin, who came by a mid-level in the ACC. Have they worked on their game? The last time we saw it was one thing, but now they have a year. They should be old, they're older, they're more experienced than other incoming guys. Um, I think that's a big challenge to them. But but you know, this the program is built on defense. They got to play better defense. Um, I think Dump has, has earned the right to have a down year, maybe even two. It's just you got to be careful having a couple of down years, then you have an empty arena, and then all of a sudden the program momentum stalls, and it's hard to get it going. Um, on the other hand, the, the, the league should be easier when you take Louisville off the top, and, uh, and you know, UConn loses Shabazz Napier. It was a sad day when the Big East broke up because I'm a New York kid and I would always go to the Big East tournament uh, at Madison Square Garden. There were some great games and some great memories. I remember watching a lot of basketball in the world's most famous arena, but this new conference, the AAC, I know they're going to lose Louisville next year, like you mentioned, but Mike Oresco has to be happy with the first year of basketball, especially with having five teams in the top 25. Yeah, and, you know, I I don't know how necessarily legitimate that is. I mean, I think it's I think it's a good league. I think you have five tournament teams. That's spectacular. That's not good. That's spectacular. And, and the big thing is SMU, and especially with the recruiting class they have and they may continue to add to, um, yeah, that's phenomenal stuff. So I just, I guess I, I wonder, you know, what happens though when you take Louisville off the top. And we, we talk about this all the time, is so often as much as you're, you're judged based on, upon the depth of your conference, 
really a conference's validity is based upon do you have a team that can make a run? Is your you know is your top you know if Arizona and UCLA are down, the Pac-12 is viewed as down. If Duke and Carolina are down, the ACC is down. Well, so now if you take Louisville off the top and UConn is down, uh, and, and it could happen because you know I know that. DeAndre Daniels, he's thinking about maybe going pro just because he struggles to play with Ryan. You know, is Ryan Boat going to be their point? What are they going to do in the future? Uh, you know, Hamilton coming in is a tremendous talent, but we'll see if he can get along playing with others uh, at, at UConn. I, I guess my question is, uh, is there going to be a legitimate top 10 team? And is it going to be SMU? And does that create enough buzz for the league to have, you know, the same kind of oomph it does this year? But I have just looked one year in the books. I think the AAC is a winner. I think the Big East is a little bit artificially inflated by Nova's record and, and some of Creighton's wins. I don't think Nova's as good as the record, uh, which leads you to believe. And uh, and I think, you know, for, for all these teams that are struggling to find stability, it's a stable league and it should be a good one in the future. I don't know if it'll be as good as it is this year anytime soon. Staying in the AC, I saw Louisville play Temple, and uh, I was really impressed with them. Patino's done another fantastic job coming off an NCAA tournament championship. And uh, I look at Louisville, I think they're, they're poised to make another deep run this year in the tourney. How about yourself? Um, I like them. You know, I can't really tell because I've seen, you know, look, what, what, what happened is we take a snapshot at the end, we're like, wow, look how they look against UConn. I, I saw them against uh, SMU at home and they kind of messed around and uh, and almost lost. I saw them against SMU on the road and that didn't end well. And then I saw them against Memphis, you know, both times they kind of kicked away the game. I, I still am not convinced, you know, I know Patino is pumping Russ and that's what you do for your guys. He loves Russ. But, but you know, like this, is Russ Smith going to make the right decisions down the stretch? And the truth is they're better when somebody else is setting Russ up down the stretch. That's why they were so good last year. Uh, the, the big change with them is the big guy starting to play inside, and they go sometimes small around him, sometimes they go big around him. And Montrezl Harrell's a beast. And there's not a lot of college players who can who can guard him when he wants to play. But there's some little things that he's still not doing because you know basketball immaturity. But I do think you know you got the Patino factor, um, you got the you got Russ Smith's experience, you got Montrezl Harrell. The, the one thing I'd caution you on is. The NCAA tournament's going to be really tightly officiated. You remember how I was officiated at the start of the year with those, you know, anytime you touch a guy's a foul. Um, you watch the first two rounds, it's going to be tight, 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 tight whistle. And how that affects Louisville is, it's, you know, it's kind of the anti-Louisville rule, you know, because Louisville constantly loves to put a hand on you. Now, Russ Smith's good enough, and some of the other guys are good enough to defend without touching a guy, but they just do. They just smack, and they kind of, they, they almost make you call fouls. So... I think that's kind of an interesting part that I'm, I'm I'm waiting to see. I think they can be a second weekend team. I think it's just going to come down to you know you better have the guards to match up and not lose the basketball. You better be tough inside. If you can be patient though, their defense will break down, and you know you just have to contain Russ Smith off a of ball screen. I think you can guard him. We're talking to Doug Gottlieb from CBS. And, Doug, uh, let's get to Villanova and stay here in the Big Five. Uh, many people believe that they're going to face off against Creighton in the Big East tournament. Nova's lost to them twice this year by a score of 96-68 to and 101-80. to uh, What does Nova have to improve on if they do face Creighton in the Big East championship game? I've talked to Jay about this. And he just, you know, he privately says, man, this is a real hard matchup for him because – you know, what they like to do is they play four out, one in. They like to follow things to their big guys. And unlike, you know, they, they don't have the personnel of St. John's who can switch on McDermott and, and stay home on everybody else. They don't they, – it's just – it's a rough matchup for them. So I think they kind of got to figure out, is, can, is there a way in which we can do something different? Can we just leave our big in the lane and guard out on everybody else and, and have him kind of be in a one-man zone and <clears> – <throat> To match up to McDermott, do we do we zone? Do we? I think you can press them. Um, I think you can trap them. I think you can force them out of their rhythm. And uh, I do think that that as much as everybody respects McDermott, he's a tremendous player. I don't think the surrounding talent is that good. Uh, they shoot it really well uh, when you let them set their feet and when they get it going. But if you can rattle them a little bit, make them shoot shots to where they're kind of questioning how quick they have to get it off. I think you can <laughs> you can cause them to miss. 
I think you can also leave on smaller guys on McDermott and just try to root him out and make him score over the top in the post. If he's beating me in the post, that's fine, as long as they're not beating you from three. And then I think you need to throw the ball inside against him defensively. I think, you know, Pinkston needs to get the ball kind of inside 15 feet, make the double team come, spread the floor on the weak side. But this is one of those games to where, um, you know, if they get there, they both get there. Uh, I know Jay would Jay would probably tell you it's just this is like one of those just rough matchups for him, just like the Syracuse zone is a bad matchup for him because how Syracuse can guard him, but also how they have to guard Syracuse. So uh, I think you know it's it's clear that there are two styles and two different matchups that they struggle with. Outside of that, they're able to be competitive with most everybody else. Does Nova need to win the Big East tournament to get a number one seed in the tourney? Yes, and even then, I don't. I mean, if I'm in that room. I don't know. They weren't competitive at Syracuse. They weren't competitive twice against Creighton. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you give which style one seed when they're going to be two teams during the NCAA tournament. I don't, I don't get that. But, you know, we're infatuated with number of wins, even if they're wins over <clears throat> average teams or teams way back in November. I mean, like, you know, Jay would even tell you, like, look, we beat, we beat Kansas in November. Kansas in November is not Kansas in February. But they could get one. I mean, to, to, to them, the big thing has got to be just, you know, we want to we want to go – we want to stay in the East. And here's something weird. Did you know that Raleigh's closer than Buffalo? No, I did not. <laughs> yeah, Raleigh's closer than Buffalo. And so if they stay true to their rules, Nova will go to Raleigh, which is just, what is it, um, but, um, I mean, I sent him to Buffalo, Buffalo and MSC. I, mean, I don't even think, that, I, I put together my, my seed lines today, and I, I you know, how do I put them ahead of San Diego State, right? San Diego State uh, has a win at Kansas as opposed to a win against Kansas in neutral site. Uh, San Diego State beat Creighton, team that beat Nova twice. San Diego State went over New Mexico. Granted, they have uh, a couple of losses at New Mexico, at Wyoming, uh, home to Arizona when Arizona's full strength. I just, you know, again, I, I look around, I'm like, man, how do, I put, how, do I, how do I put Nova ahead of Wisconsin, who's beaten Florida, Virginia, uh, who beat and split with Michigan, also beat Iowa, as did, uh, they beat Iowa twice, as, you know, Nova beat Iowa once. Like, I, I just don't, I don't get it. I, well, again, we're fascinated with number of wins. And I'm not, I'm not taking a shot at Nova like they stink. I'm just saying, look, we've seen them against top-level competition, and outside of Kansas in the Bahamas in November, I don't think they're as good as those top teams. I mean, I think, truthfully, they're probably really in the 15 to 20 range, but their their, res, their record would probably leave them as a three seed, although they're probably going to get a two seed, which would be a seed higher than I think they deserve. We're talking to Doug Gottlieb from CBS, and Doug, a few more questions right before we let you run. I know that you don't believe that Wichita State should be a one seed. They are 34-0, and and I understand the strength of schedule argument, but I just have a hard time seeing the committee going out there and not giving them a one seed, especially with their record. I believe at the end of the day they're going to get a one seed. Mm, probably, uh, but but what is it? What is their record? I mean, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the distinction between? Is it only because they're undefeated? You know, is that, is that it? I mean, if they had, had they lost to Missouri State, would they would it be would it be different? Like, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's not strength of schedule. Like people make don't make the, the the strength of the strength of schedule thing doesn't. It's not really what it's about. Okay, because strength of schedule is it's a really really flawed mathematical equation. Because here's the real way it works, all right? So when you play your non-conference schedule, you get like, I don't know, 12 games or so. Well, five of those games are bye games. You give a team a check to come to your building, and you're going to beat them. And there's there's some kind of, you know, some some of those teams, they do a lot of research. Hey, can we find somebody who's really, really good, and they'll take a check? Some of them are just like, whatever, just whoever's the cheapest, whoever's the closest. We don't have to put them up for a night. So, I mean, you look at, like, their non-conference schedule. If you just look at it in terms of the number, it's better than Syracuse's. Right? It's, a be- it's a better schedule than Syracuse's. And that's because they had, like, North Carolina Central come to town has won 22 games in one of the worst conferences in college basketball. Uh, and that's because they had Davidson come in, and they played West Kentucky, right? But look at the actual – forget that. Look at the teams that they played, right? The, the good teams that they played, teams that can actually beat you. At Alabama, bottom of the SEC – uh, they beat Tennessee, but they beat them in Wichita in their downtown arena. Okay, so it's a home game against a team that's probably an NCAA tournament team. 
They played in Kansas City, which is a de facto home game, a neutral side event. But, you know, Kansas City, Missouri is, you know, it, it was a home game when they played BYU, who's probably not a tournament team. That's not their fault. That's a decent event. And uh, they played St. Louis. I did that game. St. Louis a good team to beat them on the road. Um, and that's about where their level is. Now, compare that. So that, those are their best games. Compare that to who, who Syracuse played. Let me give you who Syracuse played in the non-conference. They played Cal, I think an NCAA tournament team. Beat Minnesota, borderline team. They beat Baylor, tournament team. Beat Indiana, not a tournament team, but at least a decent roster. They beat St. John's on the road. They beat Villanova, who's a one, two, or three seed at home, and the game wasn't competitive. Now, if you look at the, if you just look at those names, you're like, wow, how would Syracuse ever play a schedule? How is their schedule worse than, than Wichita's schedule? And the answer is they played Cornell and St. Francis and some of these other teams. It doesn't matter. Syracuse is going to beat those five teams they fought anyway, whether it was North Carolina Central or Davidson. It doesn't matter. We don't lose. Nobody loses those games who's any good. So in order to, to judge them, it's like, and then remember, Syracuse been in their conference. They beat Duke, they beat Carolina. They lost basically at the, on a you know questionable call at Duke. Um, they lost in Virginia. You know, like I, I go, it's not close. Like what would Wichita, what would Wichita do with Iowa State's schedule? You know, look what Kansas did. Kansas actually has a higher RPI than Wichita, even though they have eight more losses. Why? Because they played the hardest non-conference schedule we've seen in 20 years. Then they played in a conference which has seven, maybe eight tournament teams, and unlike most of these conferences, they play everybody twice. So, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's like Notre Dame when they were undefeated in college football a couple years ago. They just weren't as good as everybody else. Or it's maybe like Northern Illinois a couple years ago. Like, So, I know we're fascinated by the fact they went to the Final Four. I called those first two games. They were great wins. It was a great story. They're a good team. I'm not trying to disparage them as a good team. But telling me that just because they went 33-0, they played one non-D1, so you don't really count 34 now. That tell me, and, and that's again another smart scheduling thing where instead of playing a Cornell, they just played a non Division one team as a real game, and it doesn't count against their RPI or their strength of schedule. It's like genius. Um, but like telling me it's just because their record, like, I'm sorry, it's about who you played and playing two NCAA tournament teams the entire season, playing against the worst Missouri Valley that we've seen in 20 years. Do I credit them for winning every game? Absolutely. I'll give them extra credit. And extra credit to me pushes them to, to a three seed instead of a four seed. But two, two tournament wins the whole year, that's not – you can't make an equation that calculates how difficult it would be if they played in one of the decent leagues in the country. Final one here before we let Doug Gottlieb uh, run from CBS. Uh, you mentioned Syracuse. They've had uh, four uh, late losses to end out the season. Where's the level of concern with the Orangemen as they enter the NCAA tournament? Uh, well, I mean, look, when they have Jeremy Grant, remember, he didn't play second half against Virginia. He didn't play against George, uh, against Georgia Tech. Uh, when he's back, they're a different team. Uh, when his back is back, I guess. There's a fun, <laughs> uh, but a bad one. Um, but when he's back, they're, they're really, really good. You know, their, their problem is they don't have depth. And, look, I, I think that they're – you need to tell me that if they go through the ACC tournament, win the ACC tournament, they're not a one seed? Good luck with that. They have to um, be. Okay, so then who are you going to take off? Uh, that, that, that's the compelling argument because you could make the argument that you would take Wichita State off, but once again, it comes down to that 34-0 record, and I just believe that the tournament and the selection committee, they're going to give Wichita State a one seed, but if Syracuse goes out there and they win the, uh, Amer- if they win the ACC, they have to be a one seed in my opinion. Okay, so if Wisconsin wins the Big Ten tournament and Kansas wins the Big 12 tournament, you know, who are you going to take off the one line? I mean, you know, and, and let's say Villanova wins the Big East tournament. All of their resume, resumes are better than Wichita State. I agree with you. 33 and 0. You know, that's, that's the argument. It's good. Hey, listen, it's a good argument. They're a good team. Um, I frankly think, you know, having seen them in person, I think they're. They're, 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 like, they're very much like Iowa State, you know, four out, one in. The bigs aren't very good, but they're tough, really well coached. Um, they play man as well as they play zone. They press them. Um, they do a lot of really good things, kind of unique offensively. Van Bleach is a solid, steady ball handler. Lee Anthony Early is a stretch four. A little bit of a shot nut, but he's, he's gotten better than he was last year. He's, a, he's their best player. And then, you know, Ron Baker, um, 
is a is a high major level talent and athlete as like a six two and a half two guard. And then you know they have this kid, Kale Cotton, who's like a six two three man who's finally hitting jump shots. He's like their defensive uh, dynamo. I like that. It's a good team. They're not very deep. Um, you know they, their depth is deceptive. You look at them; like they've had nine guys score five or more or something in the game. It's a great stat. But the problem is they're blowing out everybody in the Missouri Valley. They'll tell you they have no real bench. Um, so, uh, but I think they're good. I, I, I've seen them, I like them. They're not as good as. I mean, they're, they're not. Michigan State plays plays Wichita State tomorrow, and Michigan State's healthy. Come on, man. I mean, to be honest, how this thing's going to go. Man, who who I put my money on? Uh, but I'm I'm fascinated to see it because if they get a one seed, here, here's the few and people people are going to tell you one seeds don't matter. What's wrong? Um, in the last eight years, two seeds have lost five times. In the last thirty years, a one seed has never lost in the first round. So essentially, your first round game is a buy. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is you're twice as likely to get to the final four as a one seed than you are as a two seed. Because remember, not only do you play a 16 to start, then your second game you play an 8-9. Then your third game, you might play a 4 at best. You're likely to play somebody who's a higher seed than a 4. So um, that, that's why, you know, every, we're going to poo-poo, a, poo-poo a, a 1 seed like it's not as important as it used to be. Yeah, it is. A 16 seed stinks. Stinks. You shouldn't, you're not going to lose to 60. So you're getting a bye when everybody else plays a game, and that's an unfair advantage if you only play two tournament teams the entire year. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you, uh, no doubt about that, especially when we've seen some two-seeds uh, been knocked off by some 15s over the years. But, Doug, we actually got to run. We appreciate a few minutes today. Right. Thanks so much, and let's do it again real soon. Anytime, dude. Later.